So um, I'm a mouthpiece for a, a large number of people who are interested in the question of applying genome sequencing to clinical care. And so everything that I say that you agree with is mine. Everything that I say that you disagree with belongs to somebody else who helped create this talk. Uh, I don't need to tell anybody in this room what this was all about. Uh, my perception is that uh, engaging the electronic medical record falls somewhere in here and understanding genomic predictors of disease somewhere in here and then implementing genomic medicine, we've already said, uh, belongs in, in this space here. And so I'm going to outline a number of efforts in uh, NHGRI that are going on to actually move those two little squares uh, into the forefront of what we do. So uh, most of what I'm going to talk about has to do with CSER. Uh, which you've already heard about, but I wanted to mention other networks that are working on this within the genomic medicine um, section of NHGRI. So uh, the two that I'm not going to say anything more about are the Undiagnosed Disease Network, which has just been uh, created and, uh, and follows really uh, the Mendelian disease uh, discussion that you've just heard, and Insight, which is uh, around the use of genome sequencing in uh, the neonatal setting and uh, raises a lot of interesting uh, ethical and operational issues that are just now being uh, addressed. So the other uh, doodads on this slide I'll, I'll say uh, something about uh, individually. IGNITE is a, is a uh, series of demonstration projects looking to incorporate genomic information into EMRs with decision support. The particular projects are, are focused on family history, on hypertension, on pharmacogenetic variant implementation, and there's one project from the University of Maryland that is sequencing around 40 diabetes uh, and related genes in uh, specific patients to ask the question whether targeting patients, for example, with extreme obesity or with lipodystrophy can, uh, using sequencing can, can help in their care. Um, the clinical center at NIH has uh, launched an exome project that uh, basically will sequence, will provide exome sequencing for uh, clinical, clinical center patients, um, and uh, they prefer to look at germline rather than somatic sequencing. It gives me the opportunity to say that most of, almost all of what I'm going to talk about is in the germline space except for some of the CSER projects, which I'll mention a little bit later, and obviously somatic sequencing is a, is a whole different topic, as Eric already pointed out, and, and then there's a, a mechanism in place to support uh, the parts of implementation in, uh, in sequence data that are going to be important, as, as I'll outline for you, in terms of consent, in terms of uh, how to implement and uh, what to do with incidental findings. Uh, the Emerge Network, which is something that I have been a part of uh, since its inception in 2007, currently has around 350,000 subjects with DNA samples and electronic medical records across around 10 sites. It's, it, I know how many sites there are, but, but uh, for bureaucratic purposes, it's hard to count them. Uh, electronic phenotyping is what we do. So just because we have an electronic medical record doesn't mean we can extract any useful information out of it. We spent the last seven or eight years showing that we can find, uh, with pretty high accuracy, people with common diseases. There are some phenotypes that are easy to do. There are some phenotypes that are much harder to do. The hope is that we'll be able to generate data on, for example, the tempo of disease progression, uh, subsets of disease that are, are particularly interesting in terms of drug response or in terms of developing complications or in terms of not developing complications, which diabetics never get uh, uh, retinopathy, for example. Those are interesting questions, and we think the electronic record should be suitable to that, and, and that's uh, an ongoing process. We've also pioneered the, uh, the use of this idea of going from genetic variant to asking with what human phenotype is that particular genetic variant associated. This idea of pleiotropy or phenotropy, I, I, I couldn't find phenotropy in the, uh, in, on Google either, but, uh, but the idea of phenome-wide scanning to, uh, to uh, understand uh, pleiotropic genetic effects is something we've spent a lot of time on. And then most recently we've started to use uh, targeted sequencing across a set of 84 genes that the Pharmacogenetics Research Network has identified as important in drug action. Those are metabolism genes, drug transport genes, and uh, drug target genes. So uh, the idea, I'm not going to dwell on this, the idea is to find patients within the electronic medical record system that uh, would be suitable for this kind of uh, 
analysis, identify the set of actionable variants within that set of 84 genes. I could say the set of actionable variants right now is about 10, um, but then sequence all 84 genes, create a repository of all the variants that we find that, that are not actionable, and for the small number of actionable genes, implement in implementation within the electronic medical record uh, system with clinical decision support and, uh, and looking at outcomes. Um, one of the things that we have found is uh, a variant of uncer uh, uncertain significance problem that, that will come up over and over again as we start to sequence uh, individuals either chosen because they have an electronic record or chosen because they have a particular disease but we're looking at their whole genome. So uh, two of the genes that are on this 84 gene platform are ion channel genes where rare variants can cause uh, something called the congenital long QT syndrome and arrhythmia susceptibility. So of the first 2,000 subjects that we analyzed, there are uh, variants in 128, and most of those are, uh, as you might expect, rare. So we asked two companies that make a, a living doing this and a research lab that makes a living doing this to look at that list and say, which ones would you tell uh, the physician and the patient are uh, likely pathogenic? And the, the, the English literature around this is interesting because they don't, they don't say pathogenic, they say likely pathogenic, possibly pathogenic, maybe pathogenic, a lot, of, a lot of sort of qualifiers. So one lab called 16 pathogenics, another 17, another 24, the overlap among the three was, th was four. So there's a problem in terms of uh, understanding the relationship between rare variants and disease at that level. Uh, the electronic medical record uh, allows us to look back and, and actually ask the question whether any of these people, any of the 48 people who had one, at least one of those variants uh, called by one of those three sites uh, had, a, had a variant, uh, had anything in their electronic record that might indicate a variant phenotype. And there was one patient with atrial fibrillation, a very common arrhythmia. There were 31 who had ECGs and one with uh, the, a long QT interval in that ECG. So the questions are, you know, which results do you return? Uh, what do you do with patients who don't have ECGs? Should you tell them to get ECGs? Do, how, how extensively do you screen the families? And what happens when the interpretation of these data changes next year or the year after? How do you recontact the patients and their families to, uh, to deal with that? So uh, NHGRI has funded ClinGen, which is uh, a large clinical genomic resource, which has many uh, mandates that, that are listed in the bottom of this slide, standardizing sharing and developing methods for annotation, interpretation, assessment of actionability. So um, hopefully that will, uh, that focus on, on, on this particular problem will, uh, will help as we move forward in, in the implementation space. But this is a large problem. So CSER, which is where most of the efforts in terms of thinking about implementation have gone uh, in, uh, in NHGRI, currently has uh, 3,500 patients, or the target is 3,500 patients, 10 projects. And the, the idea is to select individuals who have specific phenotypes, and they will then be studied by sequencing uh, mostly targeted uh, regions of the genome. Uh, uh, the hope is to develop standardized exome and genome sequencing and reporting, and ELSI has been part of this since the very beginning, and I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment. So these are the uh, phenotypes selected for, uh, for study. Most of them are uh, focused on the, uh, on the germline genome. There are two or three projects that focus on childhood cancers and adult cancers. The susceptibility to colon cancer and polyps is a, a germline project. And, and uh, the questions are, uh, what, are, the, what, are the, what is it about a patient that says that genome sequencing or whole or exome sequencing or some variant thereof will be uh, uh, useful in the care of their patients? How do you analyze those large data sets in a clinical environment? There's this whole issue around what happens. Uh, the focus here, of course, is uh, on Caucasian populations, and the question is what, how do you extend the breadth and the reach of a project like this into other populations uh, for all the reasons that we've heard about and that we all understand in terms of not just, not just being politically correct, but in terms of actually informing the biology 
Um, and then the management of non-targeted data that, that I've already alluded to and continues to be a problem. So the, the progress report from CSER is that uh, as of March 2014, and now I'm really being a mouthpiece, um, 1,500 subjects studied, mostly Caucasian, uh, and the total number sequenced over 1,000, uh, mostly germline, but with, uh, with some tumor as well. Um, I'll skip this slide. Oh, actually, let me just say one thing about this slide, and that is that the, the rate of incidental findings uh, uh, in this population is around 3% using the ACMG list of 56 uh, important genes as the benchmark, and if you look at it a different way, it's more like 6%. Uh, these, are the, these are data that were updated this weekend. Um, and so these are, and these are germline analyses only. And the important, uh, the important part is this, uh, is this last column, the yield. It, the initial data looked like there were higher yields in some diseases compared to others, and there may still be a higher yield in, in retinal disease than, than the others. But with the exception of the, these uh, cancer cases, and again, these are unselected cancer cases looking at germline genome susceptibility, um, uh, it looks like the, the yield is around uh, 40 to 50 percent in these selected subjects. This is, these are data from the Baylor Center looking at pediatric solid tumor exomes. These are relatively unselected, so the, uh, the number of patients who have actual recognized category 1 mutations is small, but there is still a large chunk with category 2 mutations. And then uh, this idea only here, over here of category 4 mutations, no, no one knows what to do with. So as I said, there has been a major focus on LC in CSER since the beginning, and that includes issues around informed consent, trying to figure out how informed consent is delivered across the sites and trying to, to develop recommendations for best practices. And uh, then this business of incidental findings, which I've already alluded to, um, the CSER sites have uh, actually had input into the way ACMG is revising their uh, recommendations with respect to um, with respect to those incidental findings. And then uh, trying to figure out what it is that patients need to know the, or want to know. The, if you ask the patients what they want to know, the, the answer is everything. But if you then ask them, well, you'll need to make a phone call to find that out, it turns out that e even small barriers like that uh, create a disincentive for people to actually want to know everything. And then collecting data on what it is that patients feel after they've gotten these data uh, is, uh, is an important part of this effort and has been embedded in, in CSER since the beginning. The, uh, uh, the issues around sequencing findings I've already alluded to, but sort of how the, the, the question of if you find a, an ion channel variant, for example, how many patients have had any kind of workup alluding to the ion channel variant? What do you do to create that workup? Um, and, uh, and then issues around cost effectiveness, how, how findings are transmitted to patient and family members, and then this whole question of ongoing reinterpretation of the genome, a variant that is of uncertain significance today may be pathogenic tomorrow or may be benign tomorrow. How do you transmit that information uh, in an ongoing fashion to the patient and to the family members who are also variant carriers? So across the uh, initiatives in NHGRI in the genomic medicine space, there are common issues around uh, integration of information into the electronic medical record, which I haven't talked about very much, but represents a continuing and interesting challenge, the return of results, the question of what is an actionable variant, uh, and, uh, and how, do you, uh, how do you share data when people are nervous about sharing their genomic information, and then this this longitudinal issue that I've already alluded to a couple of times. Um, I am part of a group that advises the genomic medicine initiatives at NHGRI, uh, and we call ourselves the Genomic Medicine Working Group. And uh, uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is create mechanisms to engage other stakeholders uh, within the community. So the other stakeholders might be payers, other academic centers, other non-academic centers, uh, stakeholders within the federal government, and uh, international stakeholders. The last uh, meeting that we had was for international stakeholders. We had a meeting in, uh, in cold, snowy D.C. in early January. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, there was, a, there was a huge amount of interest from across the world. Uh, U.S. tax dollars did not go to support any travel for any of these individuals, and yet there were individuals from 25 countries 
uh, and uh, 50 participants who showed up from the, from the countries that you can, you can see. And the focus, is there, the focus there was on evidence generation, on varying levels of health information technology from across the world, uh, on issues around education and workforce development. That's an important issue, not only for us, but across the world. And that's not only genomics, but uh, other supporting, uh, I call them supporting disciplines like bioinformatics, and then other health professionals, and then the public. Uh, there's a big interest in implementing in the pharmacogenomics space first. Uh, and, uh, and then there are questions around policy that obviously vary from country to country, and if we're going to share data across, uh, across countries, then those are the things that are going to have to be addressed. This is a, a snapshot of what it is that individuals at that meeting uh, felt that they had today and felt that they really wanted going forward. So what people really want going forward are systematic family history, genetic counselors, uh, an electronic medical record that provides clinical decision support. Uh, not so interested uh, in, uh, interestingly, in, in, in the sequencing part, or, um, but they think that implementation in the pharmacogenomic space might, might be interesting. So, so just to summarize, the challenges in implementing genomic information um, are that we don't know the function of most of the variants that we identify. And as the speakers who came before me emphasized, the way in which we're going to get at rare variant function is to develop very, very large data sets. And uh, I call this the paradox of personalized medicine. If you want to personalize medicine for an individual with a straight face, you have to be able to draw from a denominator. You can't do it because one person is different from the rest, the other 999. You can do it because 1,000 people are different from the other million people that you study. So you have to have the large denominators. So this is one, one uh, crude attempt to sort of give you a sense of the, where the large denominators are around the country and around the world. Uh, I, I'm tempted to say here that, you know, there are, there are places on this, on this map that are contemplating sequencing every single person that they have in their data bank. And the problem there is going to be they'll sequence and they will have very little idea of what to do with the data. So whether sequencing every single person in the UK biobank or in Qatar or Estonia or Iceland is a, is a great idea for implementation or not uh, remains to be seen. For discovery, it might be an interesting uh, opportunity. So the challenges are the quality of the data and the analysis. What, why was somebody sequenced? Were they sequenced because they're a worried well person or were they sequenced because they have a particular disease? If they were sequenced because of the particular disease, what are the results of that sequencing for that disease? And then what do you do about the incidental findings? And there are going to be a huge number of incidental findings. Um, and, then, and, and then there is this idea that, that we uh, all know that certainly in the ion channel space, which is where I live uh, uh, partly, there is an emerging understanding of modifier genes. And, and if we're going to do uh, large-scale sequencing, we have to be able to take advantage not only of the variants that we find, but think of ways in which the variants that we find plus the modifiers could be implemented clinically. That's a huge challenge. I don't even know what an actionable variant is. The actionable variants, uh, it's, a, it's a great word to use, but nobody actually has a great definition of it, and it may be for the indication. They may be different actionable variants for incidental findings. Um, uh, and, and then I'm, you know, you could read the rest of the slide. Engaging the patients, figuring out what they want, figuring out how to best to deliver this uh, within the constraints of perceived and real privacy and consent issues. And the, the real potential that if we do this wrong, that all we'll do is we'll have a huge number of people with variants that they don't understand or with extra medical care that they didn't need. And so there's this gr tremendous opportunity for NHGRI to really screw up uh, if we don't do this correctly, because um, I, I can certainly imagine situations in which everybody who gets a rare variant in a desbosomal gene will end up with a cardiac MRI, and that's probably not what we want. What we want. Um, so the challenges are uh, figuring out outcomes, uh, clearly engaging multiple ancestries across the country and across the world. Uh, training is a huge problem. 
we need to figure out a way of expanding the scope of uh, implementation as it moves forward from, not, from academic centers to non-academic centers to non-informatics rich uh, centers. And, and that's going on a little bit in the IGNITE projects, uh, figuring out how to implement in uh, diverse electronic medical record systems. Um, there are a number of stakeholders that we've become aware of. Uh, for example, almost all laboratory data that are delivered in, an, in, in most hospital centers are delivered to the clinician or to the electronic record or to the written record through the pathology department. And so interacting with the College of American Pathologists and other pathology entities to figure out how best to deliver that information is an important part of this. Uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, and other speakers have said it before me. We really need very, very large data sets linking genotype and phenotype. How to do that, I don't know. And then there's a, a question of interacting with regulators. There's some of this, some of this sequencing uh, is viewed as, uh, as investigational by uh, regulators like the FDA and, and, of course, figuring out how to interact with payers to get this right. So uh, I was asked to close with a slide that said, if NHGRI doesn't take coordinated action, or what, what, will ha what will happen if NHGRI doesn't do this? So my initial take was that the promise of genomic medicine, which we think we recognize uh, in terms of identifying variants that are important for disease, identifying variants that are important for drug action, identifying variants that may be clues to drug targets, uh, will be delayed. But uh, at the end of the day, the, the real imperative is to figure out how best to roll this out that maximizes patient benefit and minimizes risk that we'll do this wrong and just confer lots of costs and develop a lot of cynicism around the, the country and the community. So which patients and which targets, uh, which, which patients and which genomic targets are the right ones to focus on, uh, the well patient or the sick patient? Um, and then uh, the, the, the other point that I'll just sort of say as you read the slide is to, is to work out the realities of implementation. So there are, uh, it's easy to say but hard to do in terms of consent, in terms of EHR integration, in terms of uh, edu educating patients and providers, providing the clinical decision support, figuring out what to do in follow-up, and then uh, figuring out what any of this uh, has anything to do with uh, economic outcomes and healthcare outcomes. And, and, and I think NHGRI, prob my own bias is that NHGRI needs to play a role in that. I'm not sure it's our only role, and I, there are many other stakeholders who are interested in the economic and outcome, uh, healthcare outcomes part, but uh, NHGRI needs to be at the table. So uh, with that, I'll close and, and take questions. <laughs> We have five minutes for questions. Okay. Nobody from the Broad, remember? No, in this session you can. Yeah. Um, that was great. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on the thing you said. The last time you asked me a question, you said that the electronic record was useless. So, so I'm, I, I'm glad to hear that it's great now. No, I think I said it was not interoperable. Um, <laughs> okay. And that's still the case, but we need to fix that. Um, I was really struck by the, your, your last point about regulators. Because I think this community has a special role to play in providing guidance to the regulators. Right now, we're either in a situation where people are, are just randomly making declarations about the importance of a SNP or a mutation, or on the other hand, requiring a 510K to be filed on each nucleotide in the human genome. Neither of those are really good solutions, and it's going to take somehow a genomics community coming together and saying, here are things that are appropriate for uh, FDA approval or appropriate for reimbursement. And there are other fields like preventative services where there are external groups that provide meaningful insight and, and meaningful guidance and even in legislation they're entitled to provide that. And I think that one of the things we might think about at a large scale is how do we provide some kind of quality filter on the, well, actionability of, relevance of, choose your word, right. of these variants. So I, I was really glad you put that there and was wondering if, if somehow we might include that in our thinking. I, 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 that's a comment rather than a question, but I, I, I agree, and, and the idea of getting a 510, 510K, is that what it is? Yeah, for every single nucleotide is something that we've sort of discovered in the last eight months 
is something the FDA is interested in doing, and I think that's pretty lunatic as well. But but there, if you put yourself into their shoes, they don't want this to sort of be the wild west. They have to figure out a way of making sure that that tests that are deployed widely uh, through commercial pressures actually have uh, some some rational basis. And so I, I agree that the that it, if this community isn't going to provide that advice to FDA, I'm not sure who will. Tim? When you said delayed on that slide, I assume you meant delayed in the US. It's not going to be delayed in the UK. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're going to follow in your wake. <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know how else to respond to that. I, I, as you stress, I think the bottleneck is really the follow-up and getting the assays to go. And I think that's where NHGRI, in my opinion, could take a real lead in, in marrying these results and thinking more systematically about how to do these sorts of follow-up assays in a high throughput fashion because quite frankly everybody who's in these disease states really wants uh, even if the the it, it's far-fetched they want to have the follow-up assays done on them on these variants to figure out which ones are relevant very expensive but um this is what nhgr is good at i think actually trying to high throughput things in ways that could go very quickly and um, less expensive ways. So. Well, I, 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 I guess I'd argue with that a little bit, and I'd say that, and, I'm, and I, now I'm being a mouthpiece for me. Um, I'd say that uh, you you don't want to uh, be in the position of even insisting that every single person who has an ion channel variant gets an ECG. There ought to be a better way of filtering that, because even that is going to be a huge extra cost when it turns out. But but there are other genetic variants that that. You know, have been occur in, occur in genes that have been associated with cardiomyopathies, for example. So, so as soon as you find one of those, does that mean every single person gets an MRI? You're going to bankrupt the the healthcare system in an instant by doing that. Right. So, so we have to figure it, the, yeah. the, the the NHGRI impetus, the M NHGRI imperative has to be to figure out the filters. Sure, and I think, but but stem cells, for example, setting up surrogates that way could be done in a less expensive fashion in which you could, so thinking creatively about how to do this in, again, in, in ways that are not as expensive as an MRI, but other ways to actually get at some of these phenotypes that, and, and obviously you have to prioritize them. If they look more severe for whatever reasons, a nonsense mutation, obviously you probably would do an MRI, uh, and for maybe not so clear maybe, ones, yeah. maybe you wouldn't. I, I, I think that's a really interesting topic for debate. Yes. So, but this, I thought you made a very good point here about the marrying between the cohort scale um, with the electronic healthcare records that will, that will allow you to, because, because you know the genetics doesn't change, you can measure cohorts, you can look at, if I had made this decision to inform these people, for the subsets that were right. tested, what would have I seen? coming back out again, yeah? And then turn that around for individual individual level feedback. So I do think the large the large population cohorts are quite important here in this um, in this space that are linked to electronic health records. So you can then, you know, from current practice, work out what would have been a, uh, an effective use of genetic information uh, for those people. I, I, I agree, and I, I think that one point that needs to be made is that, that, that you know, while I'm enamored of the electronic record because I think it's sort of the, it's the real world sort of nitty gritty of the delivery of healthcare, uh, it, it can't answer every single question, uh, and there are some questions that are better answered by uh, prospective cohorts or whatever. So I, I, don't, I think the the idea of putting all your eggs into a single basket is is probably not what what I would think is the right recommendation. That said. Um, the, the end game has to be to figure out how to how to use the uh, not only deliver but use the electronic resources that we have the electronic medical record to answer questions like the one you've just posed. Yeah, I guess I want to, and this is Nicole Soranzo from the Sanger. You know, we're thinking about the same same lines, and I, I, I think ideally you want to develop resources that are deeply phenotyped with. A, Reconsent for recalling people back. Ideally, an IPSC or other type of resources where you can do ge geno genome engineering experiments, you know, before this extensive recalling, uh, recalling people. So I, I think that there are many, re many kinds of resources that could be used, and uh, yeah. uh, and and that's one of them. Yeah. Um, 
Just to follow up on you and you and comment about the genome not changing, one thing we haven't really covered at all is what is the impact of somatic, I'm not talking cancer here, but somatic mutation changes over the age of the patient impacting adult onset disorders, which would obviously require a different scale and type of sequencing. So, I, you know, I'm a heart doctor when I'm not doing this, and, and I've never had a patient say, you know, yeah, sure, have a piece of my heart. Uh, <laughs> well, but heart is probably uniquely difficult to biopsy. Well, I think brain is probably I think brain is probably no, no, just no, as hard. But you know, we I mean, if you you spend your time in hospitals as do I, and we no. biopsy no. all types of tissues I, all the time. I understand. I mean, no, no, I, I I agree with you. I was just trying to sort of highlight the you know what I'm fond of saying, and other people have said it heard it, heard it said before. You know, the oncologist the oncologist goes to the patient and asks for a piece of the tumor. The answer is a piece Peace. Take the whole thing, please. Yeah, so I've never had anybody say that. But I agree. I mean, I, it's a great unknown right now. I mean, the extent to which somatic mutation occurs and contributes to, to all the diseases that we, we want to study. I think uh, we have to go to the break now. Uh, if everyone could be back here in uh, about 15, 20 minutes, we'll get going with the final presentation.